So from the origin of life to the great oxidation event, episode three. So last episode, I discussed with you that um, there's about one to two million different um, species of bacteria and archaea on Earth, but that we only studied 0.1% um, of that, so about a thousand. And um, that is actually a problem. And this problem was first noticed in the last century when people developed um, fluorescent dyes to, uh, to see bacteria under the microscope. And what you see here is a picture of seawater um, where there's about um, 10 to the fifth cells per milliliter, cells of bacteria per milliliter, seawater. Um, but uh, if you try to grow them in the lab, you only get 1% of that. And that's actually a really big problem because um, how can we say anything about what happens in the wild when there's only 1% that we can study? What, do we, what are those other 99% doing? At the time, there was no solution, so they, the problem was uh, generally ignored. Um, but, uh, but now there are solutions, and I'll show you how they work. So we talked about those three flavors of life, the prokaryotes, the eukaryotes, and the viruses. Well, they have something in common, and that is they all work with DNA. They all work with protein and RNA. So this is called the central dogma of biology. And the central dogma is that DNA is the blueprint. It is the stored information. Um, when an organism needs to do something, it reads the blueprint, and that is called transcription, and it makes a molecule of RNA which is similar to DNA, but much less stable. Then follows translation, where the RNA um, information is now translated into protein, which is the actual machine that does things. Now here's an, uh, uh, a little bit of a, I guess, well-known uh, information about that DNA and um, protein. So both are polymers, um, DNA, um, the information is encoded in bases. Uh, every position has uh, one out of four bases, um, and uh, three of those positions are a codon and encode for an amino acid. So amino acids are the building blocks of the protein, um, the monomers that form the protein polymer, and then um, after the protein is, is made, it folds into a 3D structure that actually um, catalyzes a reaction, a chemical reaction. And this is an example protein. It is a, um, a picture of the 3D structure of Rubisco. Rubisco is the molecule that, uh, or the, um, the protein that um, catalyzes the fixation of CO2 by um, cyanobacteria, algae, plants. So, um, so a lot of, so the majority of all CO2 um, that is converted into biomass it's all done by this protein. So all the oil reservoirs, the coal reservoirs, um, your body, it's all made of molecules that start with this protein, right? And here you see it's, um, it's how it looks like in 3D, the reaction it catalyzes, and below you see kind of a representation of that, um, uh, or kind of definition of that protein in the order of the amino acids that make the polymer. Now, we humans have become very good at what we call sequencing of DNA. So um, of, let's say, I guess the first kind of main target for DNA sequencing was the human genome. So we also have DNA, we have a lot of it. And uh, you know, you take a little bit of me, you can extract the DNA out of it. And uh, you have all those polymers of DNA that, uh, that we can uh, put into a machine called the DNA sequencer, and it reads the order of the bases one by one. And we've become very good at building those machines, so um, we, the, we were able to do that very cheaply now. So that the, number, the cost reductions of, of DNA sequencing go faster than Moore's law. So you, Moore's law defines how fast we're improving our, um, our computers. So it's a really, um, revolution in, uh, in biology. So what we can do now is take an environmental sample, a little bit of soil, a little bit of ocean, 
sediment or maybe even uh, you know an older um, geological specimen, extract the DNA, put it through our device, and, um, and pull out you know millions, billions of, of bases, and uh, with a little bit of computer um, technology, we can then um, obtain whole genome sequences of bacteria that we've never seen before. Now this kind of um, presents you with some uh, with some jargon. So we call that metagenomics. So um, so if a bacterium were a self-replicating 3D printer, the DNA is a blueprint, um, and we and, and we study it. We call it metagenomics. We can also study the proteins. So what are the organisms actually doing? What kind? What, which of their machines are they? Expression, expressing, we call it metaproteomics. So those are two technologies that we use to study the microbes today. And so even though we cannot grow them in the lab, we can kind of know what they're doing based on the on the DNA and all the uh, the genes they encode on that and the machines they can make. And that's done on a very big scale now. So here's an example where a group of authors uh, goes after what they call the microbial dark matter, so no idea what it's doing. Well, let's look at its DNA and see what it's capable of. Viruses, same. Uh, very large studies uh, targeting what kind of viruses are active in the biosphere. Um, so in the context of our, um, our desire to know what happens, what happens before the great oxidation events. Um, there's a very interesting approach called molecular phylogeny. So when you take a protein or a gene that is shared by all organisms, like a ribosomal protein, um, what you could do is take that protein, let's say amino acid sequence from all the organisms, put them below each other and create what they call an alignment. So, um, so these, this protein has the same function in every organism, so it kind of looks the same, despite, you know, vast evolutionary distances between these organisms. And so um, that's what you see on this picture. It's a, it's a sequence alignment that you can use to build an evolutionary tree. And this is the latest version of, um, of well, probably no longer the latest, but a recent version of the Tree of Life, as inferred from, um, from molecular sequences. And so what you see here is, um, is, is the, you know, all life, tree of all life. The top are the bacteria. Um, you see, for example, the cyanobacteria. I'll show you in class where the cyanobacteria are, where Pelagibacter is, and Nitrosopumilus and Methanosarsina that we discussed last time. You see the eukaryotes here as a, um, as, as, emerging from the archaea, it's still quite controversial. Um, but these kind of trees can then be used to kind of infer the order of events in the, um, in the archaea era of the Earth. And I'll, I'll take you through that in, in a later episode. So just to, um, to explain this, so how does evolution work? So when organisms replicate, DNA replication, not perfect, leads to errors. They're quite rare, but especially for bacteria, because the, um, there's so many of them, and they replicate all the time, there are actually frequent mutations. So most of these mutations do nothing. Um, doesn't lead to a change in anything. Um, when it does have a consequence, it's usually bad. So um, those organisms will, um, will die off and, and leave um, so sometimes um, something good happens. This is very rare, and uh, and the organism actually gets a benefit, and so this leads to innovation, and and uh, and subsequent evolution will select for uh, for even better versions of the innovation. So another uh, interesting part of evolution is the bacteria sometimes exchange genes with each other, um, and so that can mean that. Uh, that a certain, let's say, process um, can now be adopted by another um, unrelated bacteria. It's kind of the same as what happens with our economy, right? We, we develop a, a nice new process in Canada, 
and the US or China runs away with it, right? Um, so these things happen among microbes too. Okay, so um, conclusions of this episode. So most organisms, microorganisms, have not yet been studied experimentally. Um, the central dogma of molecular biology and the genetic code applies to all life, uh, but DNA and, and protein obtained directly from the environment, so without growing anything, can be used to make inferences about unknown microorganisms. This must be a methanogen because it has the, um, the genes that encodes the machines for methane production. So DNA sequencing costs have plummeted uh, because of technology advances. Errors in DNA replication lead to evolution. And by comparing DNA and protein sequences, we can try to reconstruct evolutionary relationships in the order of events long ago. Okay, that concludes episode three.